to give you a feeling of sim um, of dizziness because it was abruptly stopped. So that's a, a, the the function of the hair in bringing about a balance and posture for you. Then how do we care for the hair? The hair should be protected from no, uh, loud noise by wearing morph. You know. When you expose your hair to too much noise, loud noise, hair and there, industrial noise, without possessing it, the eardrum is destroyed. And you don't hear you don't hear soft you don't hear soft things anymore. Until somebody starts shouting and screaming, that's when your hair will pick it and you have destroyed the, the hair. And which it may lead to deafness eventually. So you should prevent your hair. When you have to be in a noisy area, Wear hair moves. You can just put it in your hair and prevent it. And stop using hair phone. Some people will plug hair phone or headphone and somebody that is beside them or even around them will be hearing what they are listening to. It's not safe for your hair. Then you should consult, consult your doctor in the event of hair trouble, like an ache or discharge from the hair. See your doctor. Then wash or gargle your hair with mild disinfectants. To reduce the spread of infection to the middle hair via the eustachian tube. The hair should be cleaned regularly by removing wax blocking hair canal. But you should be careful in doing this. Use a blunt object covered with cotton wool to do that. And you may not even need to do it, you may just press the hair when you feel itching. Because some people have damaged their head on by so doing, by this process of removing. Works so you can just tickle the hair and it just stops itching you and just move on. So that those are the ways you can care for your hair. Now, last this is the last test program. I'll be talking about the hair, the structure and the function of the human hair. The hair is the sense organ concerned with perception of stimuli due to light. So the eye is very sensitive to light. The, mammal, the mammalian hair is a complicated spherical structure, you see, your hair is spherical, connected to the brain by the optic nerve. So it's connected to the brain by the optic nerve. Now we have, I was talking about the various parts of the eyes with their function. And the first part that I'll be talking about is the part called the sclera. This is the outermost part of the eye. Look at this diagram, you see, it's the outermost. Then it's a thick fibrous connective tissue forming the white of the eye. It's the one that forms the white part of the eye. It gives shape and firmness to the eye and it also protects the eye. The choroid is the black layer, that black part in your eye. And it's pigmented and rich in blood vessels. It prevents reflection of light within the eye. So that there is no reflection when there, when light enters your eye, there is no reflection within the eye. So the color is black colored, so it prevents reflection. Then it provides food and oxygen to so as adjacent eye parts. It forms the iris in front of the eye. We'll talk about the iris later. Now the iris is the continuation of the choroid. That is the black part. The, the choroid is the black part. So the continuation of the choroid. In front, forming a partition between the anterior and the posterior chambers of the eye. It is pigmented and is responsible for the color of the eye. The iris controls the amount of light that pass through the eye. Then the retina. The retina is the innermost layer containing the light sensitive nerve cells. Then the rods, it has the rods and the cones. The retina contains the rods and the cones. So the rods are concerned with vision in dim lights, while the cones are concerned with vision in bright lights. So rods are concerned with vision in dim lights. Cones are concerned with vision in bright light. Both rod and cones send impulses along the optic nerve to the brain, where the sensation of the light is experienced. Now we have the part called the yellow spot or the fovea centralis. That you can see it's labeled just after the sclera. It's a small depression and the most sensitive part of the retina. It contains only cones. That is, um, it receives just sensation 
that is, is concerned with bright light and color vision. You know, I said cones are concerned with vision in bright light. So the yellow spot contains only cones and gives the most accurate interpretation of an image. The optic nerve penetrates the sclerotic, the choroid, and the retina at a point known as the blind spot. So the optic nerve penetrates the scleroid, the the sclera, the choroid, and the retina at a point known as the black spots. There are no rods or cones in the optic nerve, and the region is sensitive to light. The optic nerve connects the height to the visual, visual area of the cerebral cortex of the brain. So the major function of the optic nerve is that it connects the height to the brain. So it transmits sensory impulse to and from the brain, and thus it controls the shape of the lens. The ciliary muscle is located within the ciliary body and pulls on the lens by varying its tension, makes the lens thicker, thinner or thicker from back to front. The ciliary muscle alters its focal length and results in proper accommodation. Cornea is a thick transparent tissue, which is a continuation of the sclera in front of the eye. The lens is a transparent by convex elastic structure. It's transparent, it's like glass, which is held in position by suspending ligaments. It reflects light rays and makes fine adjustments to focus to focus the image of an object on the retina. Very transparent on the eye. Then the pupil is the opening in the iris, through which light enters and focused by the lens onto the retina. It controls the amount of light which enters the eyeball. When bright light shines into the eye, circular muscles of the iris contract, making the pupil small, thus reducing the amount of light that enters the eye. So it controls light intensity that enters the eye by reducing, by contracting and making the pupil small so that the amount that, of light that enters the eye is reduced. The conjunctiva. These are the lines. This lines the high lid and covers the cornea. It protects the inner part of the eye and gets inflamed during infection. So that's why you will have that yellowish um, disease that affects the eye that people call apollo. It's called conjunctivitis because it's actually the conjunctiva that is affected. So it is the one that is inflamed during infection instead of the whole eye being affected. Then we have another st structure called the aqueous tumor and the vitreous tumor. They are solutions of salt, sugar and protein in, in water providing nourishment for cornea and lens. So they are the liquid parts of the height. A solution of salt, sugar and protein that provide nourishment for the cornea and the lens. They help to refract rays and produce image on the retina. Then this liquid also aids in keeping the eyeball firm and round, just preventing the collapse of the eye. Now, the auxiliary functions of the eye. The eye socket is located in the skull, so it eye houses the eye and protects it from me mechanical injuries such as blue. So it protects the eye socket now. This particular structure, this like the bony structure that the eyes placed in, protect it from mechanical injury. Then the eyelid is in front, protect the front of the eye from mechanical injury too. So it carries, this is the eyelid. Then it carries water from tear gland to keep the eye moist during blinking. High lashes also protect, this is high lashes. It protects the front of the eye from excessive light and shield it against sweat or dust, you know. If there is a mistake or something, you shave your eyelash and you are sweating. You see that the sweat is just entering your eye and it's peppering your eye. So that's the function of the eyelash. It protects the front of the eye from excessive light, shield it from sweat and dust. The tear gland, that's the lacrimal gland, produces a saline or salty food which washes away dust and other particles. So it, pro it produces fluid. The tear gland produces fluid. So when Tear flows, it washes away dust and other particles. Control of light intensity. The amount of light that enters the eye is automatically 
controlled by a reflex action by the iris. The iris contains both the radial and the circular muscles. In poor life, the radial muscles contract while the circular muscles relax. relax. The pupil becomes widely open to letting more, more light into the eyes, thus, thus increasing the brightness of the image. But in bright light, the circular muscles contract while the radial, radial muscles relax. Hence, the size of the pupil is reduced so that less light is allowed to enter into the eye. In this way, the retina is protected from damage by high light intensity. Now, how does image form on the retina? Light rays from an external object before reaching the retina is refracted four times by the cornea, the aqueous humo, the lens, then the vitreous humo. So, the light ray is refracted four times before it enters the retina. Then the greatest refraction takes place in the cornea, and that is the first part and the least in the humus, the vitreous humor and the aqueous humor. The lens acts as a fine adjustment that brings the ray to focus on the retina when an inverted image smaller than the object is formed. The light-sensitive cells in the retina are then stimulated and the nervous impulses gener generated are transmitted via the optic nerve fibers to the brain. The brain then interprets the impulses so that the object appears in an upright position. Now, I want to talk about a critical um, aspect of the eye, and that is the, that's what's called accommodation. Accommodation is the ability of the eye to focus accurately the image of near or distant objects on the retina. So, accommodation is the ability of the eye to focus accurately on an object, whether it is near or distant on the retina. So in man, the